I'm Jonathan Beard, and I'm a staff research engineer with ARM Research, obviously, since you guys signed up and I'm standing here. Um, so a few ground rules. So this work derives from one of my research projects, and I was like, hey, it's kind of interesting results. Why don't I go ahead and make a presentation out of it? Somebody might actually be interested. Um, so most of the results I'm going to show are either from my workstation or um, my laptop right here, which is kind of cool since I'm presenting on the laptop I'm benchmarking on. Um, one of the things that you know, I'm not going to talk about is the research project itself. I'm not going to talk about ARM hardware. I'm not going to talk about ARM roadmaps um, or anything else. I'm stick to what's in the presentation for the most part. Um, ask questions. Um, if you don't ask questions, I have plenty of questions. And hopefully we'll have some answers. All right. All right, so first off, what is a FIFO? Keep it really simple. So there's a story behind the slide. So I sent this uh, presentation to one of my colleagues who's a hardware and software engineer. And she said, oh my gosh, you're going to bore them to death. This is far too much architecture for you know, a software slash hardware crowd. Um, so I you know, simplified it, made it more generally accessible. So starting off, what is a FIFO? First in, first out queue. That should be pretty obvious, right? And so we're going to describe exactly why that's important, why we want FIFOs, and more generally, how that relates to thread synchronization. Can you guys hear me in the back? OK, awesome, perfect. All right, so my son drew the stick figure. And I was like, awesome. This is going to be perfect for our uh, presentation. So I want to uh, have stick figure A, which I'm going to label here, just say a message. Say hi to stick figure B. Sounds really simple, right? All right, so what would happen if all of you guys started talking at the exact same time? Would you be able to hear me? Would you be able to make out, say, if she wanted to say something to that gentleman way in the back corner? Would you actually be able to uh, make the message out? Eh, probably not. It's probably going to sound something, you know, in between one of these messages. It'll sound like gibberish. That's no good. And so the first part about thread communication and FIFO in general is we have to have integrity. So a message sent from A has to be the exact same as the message sent from B. And so there's a lot to that integrity. It's not just receiving the message. And at the uh, you know, bottom of this, we want to send the message directly to B. And so if I want to listen to this one person, say if I want to hear her say something, I'm going to block everyone else out. I'm just going to focus on her and listen to the message, right? And that pretty much works. We just natively do that. People, unfortunately, don't necessarily do that. Well, software, unfortunately, doesn't necessarily do that. Sorry. So ordering also matters. So if my stick figure says this to their boss you know, right at lunchtime, they say, hey, I'm going to run out and grab some stuff that you asked me to get. All right, well, what happens if I get the wrong ordering? Now, it suddenly you know, gets turned into, hey, I'm going to run over you at lunch. That's not really a good message to get. So what's going to happen? Well, the police are going to get called, things are going to get ugly, and well, we just ruined our whole day because we didn't get the ordering right in our message. All right, so at the core of this talk, it's about thread synchronization and FIFOs in general. And so I got to have the obligatory thread ordering example. We all have to have one of these, right? So producer and consumer, those are two functions. They're going to be running two separate threads. I want to send a message, which is basically ref test, which is, let's use my nice handy dandy laser pointer right there. So I want to send that message from my producer to my consumer. And most of the people in this room, what's wrong with this is immediately obvious, right? So what would we expect the answer to be? Come on, we got some audience participation at some point. Anybody? I should have brought swag to throw out. Somebody did that earlier. It was great. Um, OK, I'm just going to pick people. Uh, you, what was the, uh, what, what's the expected answer? Uh, what do you mean by the end? So what do I expect to get my consumer? Should it be 100 as ref out? Or should it be that? It, it, depends. it depends. What on what? Exactly. And that is uh, an interesting curiosity, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So to actually get this message in the right order, at the right time, from producer to consumer, we need a lot more than we've been given. And since you said scheduler, I'm going to go ahead and mention, so I had to add these in here to actually get this to execute in the right out of order um, ordering and to get this nice pretty uh, chart here. Because what happens is when you, you know, clone a process and clone off a thread, the first thing that's going to get run is that child thread, typically. And then you're going to go back to main, and you're going to spawn the producer or consumer, and then you're going to run that one. 
And so most of the time you're going to get exactly this, which is not exactly what I wanted for my answer. So just in case anybody's running this experiment at home. All right, so in case anybody wants to sneak out the back, um, bottom line up front. So I have this nice little chart, dichotomy of message sizes and the appropriate action, or at least my suggested action. So we have the amount of data and frequency, and you noticed I've picked 64 bytes. Can anybody tell me why I've picked 64 bytes? Exactly, that's your most often used cache line size for almost every architecture. Um, IBM's a little bit of an outlier there. They typically use 128 and those are for other reasons. Um, all right, so if we're only gonna do it once, atomics, multiple times, yeah, most of the time FIFOs will work for that. Greater than 64 bytes, um, locks, compare and swap data structures, um, multiple times, then you're gonna you know, go into more advanced stuff. You're gonna look at uh, pointers along with one of these other things like a uh, lock-free FIFO or a compare and swap. All right, so, well, I, nobody snuck out the back, yay. All right, so first in, first out, Q. Very simple in concept. It's uh, you know, how we communicate. We saw the stick figures earlier. Um, but it's you know, hard to get you know, perfect, especially when we want every ounce of performance out of our system. And so last year, one of the uh, presentations was, I can't remember the exact name, but basically it's like, I don't care what the architecture is doing. All I want to care about is my program. Um, but in this case, I actually care what the architecture is doing because I get really weird effects when I start trying to do um, scary and slightly undefined stuff in the architecture. And we're going to talk about a lot of them. Uh, so I just gave a quick list. I guess clock differences, um, we're going to talk about that. Coherence, we're going to talk about that a lot. Um, Non-uniform latencies, that's a huge problem. And we'll get into various ways to mitigate that and what effects it causes. And yeah, this is actually kind of funny. We have queuing delay, not just because of our queues, but we have queuing delay in the hardware. So sitting on top of that FIFO that you've just built, that's you know beautiful, you now have extra queues now in your, say, load store. You have extra queues in your coherence network. You have extra queues in the memory system. There's queues everywhere for various purposes. And we're going to get into some of that and at the points that we should actually start caring about them. All right, so FIFO, simple in concept. Um, two general types, we have lockless and uh, lock-free. Um, compare and swap, I still kind of consider those in the spin lock type category just because usually we're spinning on the compare and swap, but most people will consider those lock free. Um, for simplicity though, the presentation, I'm gonna divide them up in two, two big major categories. Ones that are just a big chunk of memory, and the other one which is a linked list. And it's kind of easy to think about them this way, and we're gonna do exactly why in just a little bit. At the very bottom, I show you a singly linked list, which is a Michael Scott implementation. It's the easiest to teach. You can have a student do this in you know, a day or so. Um, they can debug it in another day or so. Um, the thing is, it's not the most performant implementation anymore because there's an extra compare and swap. Um, and we'll talk about it in a few more slides. All right, so types of FIFOs, my chunk of memory category, which is ambiguous at first. Let's make it a little bit more concrete. So the ring buffer, you typically think of as a giant chunk of virtual memory. Um, there's a few various other implementations, but in general, let's just call it a chunk of memory. Um, virtual memory remapped. Um, we can throw these in that same exact category because underlying that we still have a chunk of what we've allocated as physical memory or virtual memory um, for my process. Bump buffers. We can also throw these in that category because you can implement those with uh, multiple pages of virtual memory or you can have a virtual memory remapped one. Um, but the general idea in all the cases is I need to get my memory from point A to point B or my data from point A to point B and as a um, low latency and high bandwidth manner as possible. All right, so my other category, linked list. So we showed the singly linked list one before. And then the one that's more often implemented today with people that have a little bit more time and non-student uh, oriented, grad students, et cetera, um, typically do this one um, in their sleep, is the uh, doubly linked list. And so their innovation was, I guess they kind of squinted at it and stood in their head, but they took the Michael Scott implementation said, hey, wouldn't it be wonderful if we can enqueue and dequeue at the head? And so they said, hey, if we just add an extra link on our linked list, both sides can be thought of as the head. Now we can just do one compare and swap on both sides. And so now we've saved roughly 50 cycles on a lot of, for most architectures, which that 50 cycles is, well, 50 integer instructions I could have operated or something else. So that's a huge saving, especially if we're gonna be um, hitting that queue quite often. All right, so commonalities, because that's what this presentation is going to be about from now on. Um, and actually, I, I 
stared at the slides and rejiggered the slides over and over and over because I was like, how do we actually, you know, talk about FIFOs and all the generic aspects that will actually be meaningful to a lot of people. And so I thought about it and thought about it, and these are the uh, categories I came up with. So we have ordering, we have coherence traffic, and we're going to talk about both of those in depth and how we can mitigate and or optimize them. Uh, data layouts, virtual memory, and placement. And also prefetch, although, yeah, we'll talk about software prefetch in a little bit. I'm not so uh, hip on that one. So before we go further, um, how many of you guys have a hardware background as well? Oh, so we have a few people. Awesome. Um, OK, so try not to fall asleep. And yeah, so we're going to talk about hardware basics. But first, a quick little quiz. So how many people think A, B, or C matter most to performance and correctness? Oh, come on. Everybody speak at once. Say again? I have no idea what you mean. All right. So does, does the core matter the most? Is the actual core? Does the interconnect, um, in this case, we're talking about the coherent interconnect, which hooks the caches to, say, the L3 and the rest of the system. Um, every multi-core has got one. And lastly, memory in general. Um, it's a broad category, and yeah, I don't want to get any uh, narrower than that. So since you spoke first. So if B means cache coherency, it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, I'm going to take a different tact. I'm going to say all the above. It's kind of a trick question. I intentionally did not put all the above because everybody would pick it. Um, and so I think all the above matter. And we're going to talk about exactly why. My personal preference is the last two matter the most. However, if we can't issue our instructions in the right order and we can't actually do a proper out-of-order processor, then we're not going to get a proper FIFO in the first place. So, All right, so... Instead of doing Architecture 101 class with a specific processor, I made this wonderful, nice, totally abstracted and slightly false, but still correct, block diagram of a core. And so we're going to start off with our core, which to load an address, we have to go through our load store queues. We have L1 TOB, L1 data cache, and we're hooking that directly to our coherent bus, which in this case, we're using bus as a generic term because our bus is actually our coherent network, which in most cases, we're talking a coherent mesh network these days. And memory. So I've abstracted this as much as I humanly can while still making it useful. All right, so the first thing I wanted to talk about was the load store queue. So I don't know, how many of you guys have looked around at, say, older FIFO implementations, looked around at the software? OK, we got one person in the back. Um, one interesting thing I've seen, some people decide to use a particular feature of your load store queues and how they hook to your L1 data cache as an implicit memory, memory barrier. Um, now, this is kind of an issue, and I'll tell you why in just a second. So our load store queue does implicit reordering inside the load queue. Architectures do things most efficiently in bulk. And so with your load queue and store queue, it, it talks to the L1 data cache with a certain width. In most cases, it's 128 bits. And so in every cycle, you get 128 bits. Some architectures do 256, um, particularly vector architectures. Um, some even go a little bit wider than that. But in general, it's 128. And so in some of the older FIFOs, you'll see people decide to, instead of issuing a barrier, because barriers are slow, as in a memory barrier in the uh, instruction stream, they'll use the fact that I have this 128-bit uh, basically bottleneck between my L1 data cache and my store queue as an implicit memory barrier. Um, well, that creates fun and interesting problems to debug when I decide to go to a wider width. So I decide to move that code to a different processor. Or if I decide to run this on an SMT machine, so simultaneous multi-threading, I can't name any architectures off the top of my head, but imagine a scenario where instead of separate or distinct load store queues, I decided to share them. And so now both threads have access to that same load and store queue. And that actually makes sense for some you know, reasons, I mean, you have direct access to the data that's in them. And so you can actually bypass and go much faster than accessing your cache. So for those reasons, this is a very bad idea. So don't do that. All right, so on the pathway from our core to our memory system, we have this fun thing called virtual memory to physical memory. So at this point, how many people are familiar with virtual memory? <laughs> 
and how it's actually translated. Okay, so I'll go through this a little bit fast. Um, so at this point, most caches are virtually indexed physically tagged. And what that means at my L1 level is I can access my cache, which is my actual memory, with a virtual index without actually translating my address. And then I can access my L1 TOB, which what that TOB is, it's a translation look aside buffer. It stores my translations. So by simultaneously accessing them, I can look at my data, I can look at my translation, I translate it to a physical address, and then I can now look up based on my translation and say, hey, is this the right actual data or not? Because remember, I looked it up with a virtual index. Um, I'm gonna put a pin in that one because we're not gonna talk about it just yet, but give me a few more slides because it really comes into play when we start talking about system software and placement. Um, but the thing to remember is we have to do that translation at this step. It's critical. All right, so, oh, put this one right after. Okay, so most uh, architectures, most operating systems expect virtual memory. I mean, if you look at POSIX, most of POSIX is built around the idea of we have this virtual memory abstraction, which makes a nice zero through two to the 64th, you know, memory space that's relatively fat. Well, um, what that gets you is a fully associative memory space. And so what that means is I can take pages and I can put them on any physical page and, and I show that up down here and those colors did not show up as well, um, but that's okay. So pages come in a variety of sizes. So when I set up my system, I can set it up to use uh, 4K pages, which most by default are. I can use 64K uh, pages or two meg pages or one gigabyte pages. All right, so you guys are kind of falling asleep. So why does this matter? Um, it matters because that determines how many of those uh, entries I can put in my TOB and how much space I can actually translate before I have to go get another entry. So what I didn't tell you about this structure here was that it's a fixed size. So I can only fit, say, 64 or 128 translation entries. And so that's 64 or 128 of these in here. Any idea what that does to my translation space? So if I can only fit, say, 64 4K pages in my L1 TOB, what happens when I want to get to the 65th? And I don't everybody talk at once. Um, okay, so if I want to get to the 65th, and I think I heard swapping, what I'm gonna have to do is go to my L2 TOB and backfill my L1 TOB. And if my L2 TOB doesn't have it, then I'm gonna have to go do some uh, page walks. And page walks these days, we have hardware acceleration for them. So they're relatively okay. So your L2 TOB has what's called a hardware page table walker. Um, so this is all well and good. The problem is right here, is every time I want to backfill my L2 TOB, that's like four extra memory references. So four extra memory references, and then I'm gonna throw out this number, 64. So just picture each one of those memory references as on a separate cache line. And I have to go access each one of those, and so that's, what, 256 bytes that I have to go grab just to fill that one memory reference on average. Um, that's pretty ugly, especially when I want to just dereference a single pointer. Kind of silly, right? Um, so, how many people run stuff on Amazon Web Services, like cloud services? Probably a lot of folks. Okay, so when I run something in a cloud, I run my guest operating system on top of a hypervisor, and that hypervisor is basically a guest operating system. Then I have my page table system set up inside my guest, uh, guest OS, which is what you see. And then on the outside, you have another set of page tables. And so this results in what's called a nested translation um, page table walk. And that can be 2D, 3D, it gets kind of ugly because you have multiple levels of nesting. Sometimes you run guess on top of guess on top of guess. And this just adds to the memory references. And so the example I gave here, oh, I didn't actually write the example. So verbally, it takes 24 memory references roughly if you just have a two level nested translation. So that's 24 memory references every time I miss at my L2 and have to go fill it. And that's just ugly. I mean, it's 24 times 64 bytes in the worst case. I mean, it's Huge, um, and that's just for my translations. All right, so I wanna minimize that if possible. So that's one thing we're gonna look at in a little bit. All right, so I just talked about the L1 data cache attached to the core. Anybody remember exactly what the average width is for my L1 data cache to my core? Man, nobody's taking notes. So is that? No, it's not 64, so usually it's around 128 bits. And so my core can only look at 120 bits of my L1 data cache at a time per cycle. And so say if I have 
a 512 wide vector, that's gonna take several loads to actually, or several loads from my O1 to actually fill up. Um, that's another fun thing with vector architectures, but um, that's besides the point. So it's different from my L1 backwards. And so if I'm looking between my L1 and my L2 and my L2 and my coherence network, I'm gonna say right now, it's not quite accurate, but let's just say the minimum granularity that we're able to communicate and talk to everyone else is um, 64 bytes. And so at a larger granularity outside, my core to my L1 cache is or 128 bits per cycle, roughly. Um, and that's pretty standard. Some, like I said, some people use 256. All right, so that's something to keep in mind when we're talking about coherence, which is what we're talking about next. All right, so how many people have seen the uh, MESI protocol? A few hands, there we go, okay. So if I wanna bring something in, say I just, you know, from core zero that was on the prior slide, if I wanna just bring a data value in and take a look at it, um, I'm gonna bring it in in what's called the um, exclusive state, because I'm the only one that's got it. Um, that's kind of important um, for a particular reason, and I'll get to that in just a little bit. So. First, if I want to bring it in, either read or write, doesn't matter, it's gonna be an exclusive. And what that tells me is that if I'm core zero and I've you know, just gotten it, and it's an exclusive, it means nobody else has that value, which is hugely important for our little exercise we're gonna have in a minute. Um, if somebody else wants to read that line, say if I'm on core one, and I want to just take a look at that line that's in core zero, and it has an exclusive state, it's not modified or anything else yet, it has to go say, hey, core zero, I want to take a look at that. Can you, uh, can you change your state to uh, shared? Then it has to send an ACK back to core one, and core one can now bring that line in, install it in the cache, and bring it into shared state. So that's like three different uh, coherence traffic steps on my bus just for that one read to bring it into shared state. But shared state's kind of cool because it means multiple cores can look at that same exact line, and yeah, nothing else happens. The problem comes in if I actually want to, say, write a line. Say if core one now wants to write that exact same line, now I have to go and say, hey, core zero, I need you to uh, invalidate that line, send me an act back when it's done, and then once that's done, I can now move my line to modified, and then I can actually complete the write. So that's four extra, or three extra bus steps. There's actually a few more in there, I'm skipping just to make it simpler, that have to occur to make that write happen. So yeah, things are a lot more complicated under the hood than they actually seem. And we've gotta keep this in mind once we start trying to optimize our FIFOs. And so, let's see, how much time do I have left? I didn't even start my counter. Okay, an hour left, and I'm on slide 30 out of 59. Okay, I better not do the class exercise as I had actually planned. Um, okay, that was actually kind of going to be fun. We're going to divide everybody up and simulate a cache in real time. However, <laughs> let's just make this an uh, interactive exercise for uh, speed's sake. Um, okay, so each one of these is a cache line, and each cache, lo and behold, only has one cache or one line inside it, and it's addressed from, uh, well, in this case, zero through 15, so we have uh, 16 uh, bytes. In this case, same exact thing, same exact thing. And so each one has separate lines in various states. So if you notice, these two guys have the exact same line, and it's in a shared state. All right, so now, what happens if cache one, which is attached to a core, wants to modify this line or write to it? Anybody tell me what happens? Yes. Yes. So it's going to invalidate cache zero. It's exactly correct. And then it's going to act back from cache zero to cache one. Say, okay, you can now upgrade your cache line. This one changes it to modified state, and then the core itself can actually drop the uh, new value into the cache. And so now you have a fresh new up-to-date value, um, which is different than the old value. And so if core or cache zero now actually wants to read that line again. Um, what would happen? Oh, come on. Somebody's got to know. Exactly. And so cache zero is going to have to say, hey, cache one, please, uh, please change this to shared state. I want to check it out. And then cache zero is going to get an act back along with the update values of the line. So instead of actually going all the way out to memory, we just now snoop it across my coherent network. All right, so... It's not quite as simple as we just made it out to be. The thing is, if cache one asks for a line, how does it know which cache to go to? Any ideas? No, okay. So if cache one says, I need this line, it has no idea what's in the other cores. So the simplest solution, what um, 
was done in a lot of really old architectures at first until people came up with much better solutions, um, is simply broadcast to every other core and every other cache and say, hey, do you guys have this line? If so, send an act back in for the proper state. Um, this creates a heck of a lot of extra traffic. It's something that we don't necessarily ever want to do. And so most cores implement something called a directory or a snoop filter. And so that basically says, I either have the line here in this quadrant, here in this quadrant, or with a directory, most of the time I can know exactly where that line is and send my traffic directed to that particular cache, which is nice and it cuts down on you know, tons of traffic, especially once we have you know, large multi-core processors. The reason I tell you this is because if you're going to you know, start looking at um, optimizing uh, cache line you know, size or cache line uh, ping-ponging for data, data structures, or got that backwards, if you want to optimize data structures for cache line size to minimize um, this data movement, um, it's oftentimes you know, good to know whether you're dealing with, say, a snoop filter or a directory structure because um, if I have a directory, then a lot of times you know, I don't necessarily really care. But if I'm broadcasting to everywhere, I, I want to make darn sure that all my data structures are perfectly optimized for access patterns. I'm not broadcasting to all my cores. And similarly for a snoop filter, there's some other tricks we can do with the data structures to optimize the placement. Um, okay, so, yep, done with that one. So, um, cache plus translation. So, I alluded to this just a second ago. And the basic, you know, idea and the basic idea behind this whole presentation is you want to minimize data movement. In fact, that's my area of research. It's all I do now is look at data movement and how to minimize it. It's kind of fun. Um, we want to, you know, look at things, you know, access things on the bus, talk over the bus as few times as humanly possible. Um, translation, we want to keep it local and we want to keep it in our TOBs. And so that also means uh, optimizing the you know, page layout, the physical page layout, where those pages are located. And again, we're going to talk about strategies to fix all that in just a little bit. Um, okay, so virtual memory has a really long and interesting history. Um, you have fun talking about it over a beer. It might be a boring conversation, but I find it fun. Interesting. Um, so I mentioned this before as well. We can take any of our virtual pages and map them anywhere in our physical memory. Um, that's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing because it means I have no idea what kind of memory my page is actually living on. It could be in disk, it could be in DDR, it could be in non-volatile RAM. Um, so that's a problem. So we're gonna talk about some interfaces to play around and look at the placement in just a little bit. Um, yeah, I guess the thing to keep in mind here is how many people think the virtual pages are actually contiguous to your physical memory? Always. No, okay, good. That's a good assumption, especially looking at the picture. It should make that fairly obvious. Um, okay, so I have page zero and page two here, and they're mapped to my DRAM to these physical addresses, and this is gonna matter in just a second. And then page one is page dot to disk. I'm not accessing that one much. All right, so back to our generic diagram. I want to dereference this guy. I'm going to follow the whole path all the way through and go through my TLB process, go through my bus, and I'm just kind of striding across this uh, virtual memory range, accessing memory. You know, I'm starting off on page zero, everything's all great. But, all right, well, unfortunately, somebody mapped page two to another NUMA node. Can anybody, you know, take a gander at what's going to happen once I swap within this virtual range from going from here over to here? Any ideas? Well, nobody has any ideas. Um, okay, so my first access is gonna get much slower, which is unfortunate. Um, and Linux and most operating systems implement what's called first touch. And so I've run into this a lot where you have th uh, thread migration for load leveling or load imbalance. And you wanna do this in data centers quite often. So it happens, unfortunately, more than you probably realize. So if I've allocated my memory on a thread that was operating on the core that's not present, but operating up here. And my operating system initially operate, or, uh, allocated, say, page two over here, and then I migrate my thread over here, and I allocate more memory, which just happens to be page zero, and I'm now operating over here, that page isn't gonna move, unless you do something about it, and unless your runtime's fancy enough to actually do something about the page migration that's efficient. And so when I hit this particular address, it's just gonna get slower for the first few accesses until I can start caching in the memory. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a bit. All right, so this is a graph kind of showing um, in cycles. It's not perfect, uh, be honest about that. But 
it shows if I'm on the same node, I'm accessing my memory. My latency for memory is pretty, I mean, that line is darn thin. Um, so that's the what, first uh, 50th percentile, and that's the bottom 25th quantile and the upper 75th. Um, or no, I think I did this graph, sorry. Fifth and the 95th, and that's 25th and 75th. So 50% mass in the center, it's very small. And then if you jump over to the separate NUMA node, as in the case where we had yeah, page two over here, we're looking at much more varied access times. Um, so this is typically going to be like your first access. And then once you start paging or uh, caching your memory, you can start to get ahead of it and you start to see more regular access times. And those access times are actually your caches and not your uh, direct access to your DDR. And so you can actually prefetch and hide some of those latencies once you actually touch the memory. All right, so I just mentioned prefetching, which was in, you know, on purpose because it's a prelude to this slide. So, um, actually, let me pause for a second. I'm going fast just because I had a lot of slides and a lot of stuff I thought was pretty cool. Any questions so far? Oh, man, you guys are a tough crowd. Totally should have brought swag. Yes? Um, the, the, the you only have the MPSI or Messi. Or mm -hmm. Yes. Ah, okay, so I can actually go back to that slide real fast if my mouse will cooperate. There we go. I got it. Nope, I don't got it. Yeah, I can in just a second. I was going to pull up the slide first because the slide is actually important for answering said question. There we go. That should be the one. All right, so the question was um, I didn't really, when I was talking about this slide, I didn't necessarily um, go into detail on the E and the question was the I state as well. All right, so the E state was exclusive and the I state is for invalid. And what that essentially does is, well, the first protocols that were invented were just M, S, and I. And so with that, the first time I brought a cache line into my cache for my core, um, I didn't know whether I had the only copy of it. And so that's kind of important because when you bring something into your cache, the, Oftentimes, the first thing you do to it is turn around and write to it. And so, you know, you read something, you modify it, then you want to write it back. Um, well, they found that this M, S, and I protocol is fairly inefficient. And so when they added the E state, they're like, hey, you know what? This E state is helpful because it indicates that I'm the only core that has brought this one in. I'm the first core that's pulled this line in. I'm the only core where it exists. And so if I want to turn around and write back my modifications immediately, then I don't have to go turn around and broadcast to all my other cores to go find or change the state for that cache. The I state um, is basically the dead state. And so if I have any of these other um, coherent states for a cache line, and I want to change from, say, S to M in one of my cores, say core zero is writing it and wants to modify it, all the other cores which had this line in the shared state are going to go to the invalid state. Um, does that answer your question? Awesome. All right, any other questions? We can go back through slides and go backwards, forwards, around, okay. Let's see, where was I? This one. Okay, so prefetch, maybe. So first I'm gonna talk about hardware prefetchers. So almost every modern core has what's called a hardware prefetch unit at the, well, generally at the L2, L3 level, but some even have them at the L1s. Um, and what this does, it takes a look at what they call streams. And streams can be roughly thought of as pages. And typically this is 4K. Um, I'm not aware of anyone that's actually gone to variable size streams, but most of them are 4K. And so what this does, it takes a look at the data patterns for that 4K and says, hey, I think this guy is going to access this line next. And that, in fact, is actually the name of a prefetching algorithm, next line. And typically, um, a lot of cases, it's the next four lines. And so if you're on a striding access pattern, just streaming data through, it's going to grab the next four lines for you. And that's really good because while the core is doing something, it's going to be grabbing the next four lines and hiding a lot of the latency, and it's going to be sitting in your cache ready to go. Um, okay, so where does this go bad? Um, what happens if I don't need the next four lines? Or what happens if those four lines just evicted, and going back to the coherence question, turned my shared state to invalid state, evicted those lines, and now re replaced them with those prefetch lines that I just didn't really need at all. Um, well, this happens, and it's not good. And so we have to work on techniques to mediate that particular behavior. 
Um, what I wanted to look at here was you know, something that we can actually do when we allocate memory. So I said stream is roughly contiguous to a page, right? So most prefetchers stay inside a single page. And so when I allocate memory and I'm staying within my 4K page, I'm just going to start prefetching a lot of that same page. And the same goes with two pages. Once I get to this next spot, I'm going to start prefetching that memory as well. Um, some more modern architectures actually do next page as well. And so that's where things can actually start going bad again. Um, I've seen this a lot with people just allocating odd size non-power of two uh, FIFOs, not really realizing what they're doing, but they'll have, say, you know, part of another page and just enough for the prefetcher to start picking up on it and go, hey, let's start prefetching the rest of that page. Well, the page is just invalid, dumb data that nobody actually wanted. Um, and if whoever was allocating the FIFO actually realized that if I you know, allocated page size chunks at a time and you actually used all of my page size chunk, um, then I would get much more efficient prefetching. So that's number one. And you know, I ran some benchmarks on, let's see, the top one up here on a newer architecture, which has the next page prefetching. And turns out, and this is a few million executions, so it's not actually one per um, push. I guess I should have said that first. And so these stats are just for the pushes and pops. And so looking at the push on a FIFO and the pop on a FIFO, and this is a simple ring buffer. Uh, so we're looking at 78L1 data cache misses, 78L2 data cache misses. And when I allocate my data like this with just enough overhang into this page to unfortunately hit my um, next page prefetcher, I start grabbing the wrong stuff. And so I end up with lots of uh, prefetch misses. And so that's like one miss every you know, 4,000 or five, well, sorry, that's 10 or 12 misses every four or 5,000 um, accesses. And so it averages out to around one extra prefetch miss which I could have just totally avoided because that's data in my L1 data cache that I could have used for something else. So by allocating on page size chunks, we can avoid all that behavior, which is something that we definitely want to do if we're trying to get the last ounce of performance. All right, so any questions on that one before we move on to the systems programming stuff? No, okay. So yeah, can you tell I have a love-hate relationship with virtual memory? It's kind of wonderful in some cases, it's horrible in other cases. Sometimes I just wish I could take the red pill and be like, yeah, yeah, use all physical memory. But the problem with that is, I end up with, say, like a CUDA mem copy scenario for every time I want to access memory. That is, if I used physical memory for everything. And so I'd have to manually take my physical memory, move it out to disk, move it back. It's just a, not a good way to program, which is why we have virtual memory in the first place. So I'm going to stay blissfully ignorant in most cases and stay with virtual memory. Um, okay, so why does this change in virtual memory to physical matter? Um, okay, so cache line location state, we just talked about that one a little bit. Page placement, um, that's going to matter quite a bit, especially when we start talking about NUMA. Um, kernel paging policy, we're going to talk about um, some systems programming stuff that modifies that a little. And yeah, as I said, I definitely like physical in many cases, but we're stuck with virtual, that's where everybody works, and it's portable, so yeah. All right, so when we load our memory and we allocate stuff, 4K pages are the standard, but they're not always. So I'm gonna give a lot of Linux examples, sorry for the Windows folks, I didn't go through all the Windows APIs and list those two, but um, equivalent uh, interfaces typically exist for Windows and most other operating systems. Um, so. In Linux, I can use the uh, sysconf to find what my current page size is in some cases. Um, or I can go look at some of the other uh, feature bits and say, hey, I've now set these up for 64K pages. And I can start allocating for all of that. Um, yeah. The only other problem is I might not have, uh, <laughs> I might not have an actual physical page. And so the other fun thing in virtual memory is pages are zero allocated typically. So if you allocate memory, it doesn't actually exist. It's just a virtual entry that doesn't really go anywhere. So only when I actually touch it does that real physical memory actually get allocated. And so that's slow, and we're going to talk about some ways to get around that. Um, so yeah, why use MemMap? There's really no reason. Most people should not use MemMap. Um, <laughs> people 
use it because they think it's faster. And I've seen this in so many GitHub repositories that you know I, I can't even count the number of times I've seen it. But the thing is, if you POSIX uh, memaline, or which basically doesn't allocate, or if you do uh, malloc, or if you do new, um, for a large enough allocation, it's going to call memmap under the hood anyways for you with the appropriate flags. Um, the only cases where you're actually going to want to use this is if I want to put my virtual memory in a specific location. And that can't always be guaranteed either. Um, so there's really no advantage other than, yeah, I can allocate huge chunks of memory directly. Well, I guess one advantage, maybe shared memory. How many people use shared memory for process communication? Okay, a few. So that's one of the few advantages of using MimMap is you can allocate large chunks, put them on a file descriptor, and map them into my process. So, um, okay. But other than that, there's no performance reason to use MimMap, which I don't know, I don't know why people use this, but yeah. So MAdvise, how many people think, how many people have used MAdvise? Yeah, a few, okay. How many people think it does something for a general allocation? Yeah, okay, no hands. Um, so if I have a large chunk of memory and I've mapped in, say, a file descriptor with a file backing, I might actually use MIM or MIMAdvise for my kernel page cache. Um, in that scenario, it works. But if I have an anonymous mapping, which is just you know what malloc will give you or new, huge chunk of memory, MIMAdvise really doesn't do that much. The only really useful features on this are when we start talking about the MIMAdvise do not use. And that just tells my kernel that, hey, I can deallocate this physical memory. I don't really need it anymore. But then again, that causes other problems, and we'll get to some of those issues in just a little bit. Um, yeah, so I went ahead and profiled this one just for kicks. I knew it didn't really do much, but yeah. Um, <laughs> no discernible advantage for using MIMAdvise on any of the settings for any of the FIFO types, including the boost, ring buffer, or whatever. Um, OK, so moving along. Actually, should stop and ask any questions since I'm starting to go fast again. No questions, OK. So um, I mentioned that my virtual memory pages, when I initially allocate, it's not necessarily actually physical memory. There is nothing there. Um, one way of kind of forcing that and say, getting physical memory right up front is uh, mlock or locking pages. So the interface in Linux is mlock, mlock. Um, it's quite useful. Um, the problem with mlock is one, typically you have to have root access depending on how you've set your system up. And two, on shared systems, you're typically not going to be able to use this anyways, because I can guarantee you Amazon is not going to want you to lock up their physical memory and <laughs> keep it from all the other guest OSs that are out there. So if you're on a non-shared system, as in a private system, server farm, et cetera, go ahead and use mlock. It'll actually you know, pre-touch the pages, which yeah, I can't fully explain, but that's my hypothesis is that Basically, by pre-touching all the pages, you're, um, in some cases, pre-loading them inside your uh, L1, which I did notice, you know, a few extra prefetch, you know, actions there as well. So that could explain it. Um, theoretically, MLock just locking the pages shouldn't actually give you a performance boost, um, except when you're actually paging in that initial page. And so it's first touch when you actually do allocate your physical memory. That's the lag that you're getting rid of with MLock. You're basically doing what the operating system will have done once you start touching the memory. You're doing that up front. The downside is, again, you are taking memory away from everyone else using the system, um, and you're potentially you know, doing some other stuff that's not necessarily good, but again, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, okay, so most systems these days are NUMA outside of your laptop. Even some laptops are now NUMA. Um, so if you have a multi-socket system, typically you have multiple NUMA nodes in the system. And what that means is, at a high level, um, you're gonna have different uh, latencies. And so when I wanna access a page from, let's see, if this is one NUMA node and this is another NUMA node, eh, I should have gotten rid of these reordings, but that's okay. And I wanna access memory that's on this one, I'm gonna have a different latency than this NUMA node. The thing is, I can fix that. And so I mentioned the first touch policy. Does anybody remember what the first touch is? Oh, come on, I should be taking notes. All right, you get, what is it? It, well, when you touch it, it loads it in. But first touch that I'm uh, referring to is when the first time that you've allocated that memory, that memory is going to live on the NUMA node from which it was allocated typically. And so if I'm calling from a thread that's on, say, this node, it's going to be allocated on this node. And if I migrate the thread, the operating system typically isn't going to be nice and migrate it for me. Um, 
for performance, um, that's, that's a problem. So I want to load balance. I want to move threads around. That's obvious. But I've also got to be able to move the memory to match. My memory needs to follow my threads behind, but needs to follow. And so Linux has this nice interface library that you can uh, grab, which is a uh, libnuma. And basically what it does is it takes the physical page and moves your physical memory from this NUMA node to this NUMA node. And the cool thing is it keeps the virtual address exactly the same. Can anybody tell me anything wrong with doing that? Since we don't have the coherence, it might not be totally obvious. So if I change my physical addresses, um, let me step back one step. So my L2s are physically indexed and physically tagged. And now I've just changed my phys physical address for that virtual address I want to access. What's going to happen to my data and my cache? Can I still access it if I don't have the same physical address to index it? And say again? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's pretty much worthless. And so now I have to go re-pull that data back into my new core. Um, so stuff that was cached is no longer cached. So all my temporal locality is pretty much shot once I've done this. So now I have to go pull it all back in. I mean, temporal locality is still there, but all the gains that I've gotten by pulling stuff into my cache is just gone, which is unfortunate. But the cool thing is, if this is a you know, gigabyte page and I've just moved it behind the scenes over here, I now have faster access to it and I can start prefetching it faster and do all kinds of other cool stuff. And I freed up physical memory on this NUMA node for threads that actually live next to that NUMA node. Um, so one thing I want to talk about here, I guess, I don't think I have another fancy slide for it. Um, Non-volatile memories and other emerging memory technologies. So you see a lot of interfaces. I know Intel's got one now, which is the uh, MemKind interface, which is going to wrap around a lot of other stuff. Um, you'll see these interfaces come out, and ostensibly, they allow you to place memory on these memory technologies. So I can place something in, say, my MCD RAM or my you know, other memory technology aside from my DRAM. Well, it's all well and good. The problem is they're non-standard. And so every time I want to switch um, you know, vendors or switch um, architectures, I may have to go get a whole new interface and report all my code, which is unfortunate. Um, so if you notice, like the, uh, how many guys or gals in here use OpenMP? Anybody, a few. So one of the TRs that we just worked on uh, specifies um, memory placement hints. And so instead of saying, I want this on you know, this particular device with this exact name, I can specify um, you know, locality. I can specify things like bandwidth. I can specify things like uh, volatility um, eventually. And if that gets approved, that'd be quite nice because that's exactly what we need. And hopefully, eventually, C++ will get something like that too, where I can say allocate on a specific memory technology by specifying characteristics and then let the runtime figure out exactly what device to allocate it on. So that'd be cool because then you can still have your portable code and get the benefits of all these nice fancy memory technologies we're developing. Um, let's see, I guess the other thing here to keep in mind is this line which I unfortunately skipped over when I was going into the NUMA moves. So one thing I've noticed when building FIFOs is that depending on whether my producer and consumer are in the same NUMA node, you get interesting performance characteristics. So let's say this is node one, this is node two. If my producer is here and my consumer is here, I actually get better performance if I'm writing to here, which is kind of interesting. And I found this on Intel architecture, especially if I use non-temporal writes, then fences, I can write, get you know, just the same performance on the opposite NUMA node, and then my reads are improved on this or in the uh, consumer thread. So that's another thing to try on various architectures. Um, I can say it works in things like Haswell. I'm not sure if it works on every architecture in general, um, but something to give a shot. All right, so I said lots of you know, cautionary notes while I was going through the slides. Um, one thing I was preparing these slides, I was kind of looking around for bug reports because I found um, do not need, um, combined with transparent huge pages, you get some strange effects, um, being that you can't necessarily deallocate one 4K page out of my now transparent coalesced huge page. Um, I think, oh geez, what was the example? Um, RocksDB was one of them. Um, so that's one thing to be careful for when you're image advising stuff. So the other things, locking pages and moving pages. If you have latency critical code, um, don't do a move, just leave it. Um, also, if you're locking pages, please unlock them. <laughs> as soon as you don't need them, go ahead and free up the memory. I mean, it's going to clear out when you uh, exit your process. However, 
just go ahead and be nice to the operating system and other you know, applications, free up the physical memory. All right, so now actual software out of the uh, system stuff and into some real code. All right, so I was trying to have a little fun with this one. Um, so perusing GitHub and everyone's lock-free FIFOs and locked FIFOs, even though people claim they're lock-free, a lot of them still end up using these uh, pthread mutexes, not realizing they're locks. Don't use those FIFOs. Um, so people use these way too often. And mutexes are good, they're simple, they always work. And by the way, these slides are available on my uh, Twitter feed, so they're pinned to the top of my page. If anybody wants to grab them, you can grab the whole deck. Nice high resolution. Um, but the problem with using mutexes all the time is that basically a mutex is a whole cache line. So what this means is I've padded the data structure that is my mutex, which is all this code in Linux. Um, padded to 64 bytes, which makes sense for performance. But that also means that, well, I've now evicted a good line. If this mutex is contended for quite often, then it means I'm moving that line around, which for each one of those lines I move, that's like, what, four coherence operations. That's a lot of traffic. Um, that's not good. I want to not do that as much as possible. So these are good for a lot of stuff, but they're also overkill for many things that we'd like to do. And so I have these other suggestions on here. We have compare and swap atomics. We have um, spin locks. We have... You know, now a lot of architectures have hardware accelerated atomics, um, which is we're going to get to in the next slide. This is an interesting application. How many guys have, or how many folks have touched Parsec? It's a popular multi-threading benchmark suite. Um, well, I won't say which app, but yeah, this little gem of code right here is fun. So can anybody tell me, this is a floating point uh, number here, and yeah, this is just a floating point ad. Um, so, I have to do the modulus, but so, what's wrong with this? Anybody? Say again? Well, okay, so that, that is one, uh, one thing. If you exit abnormally, you could leave it locked. That's not quite the answer I was going for. Um, yeah. Say again? Yeah, so I mean, this is one mutex, and then you're doing a single add, and then you're unlocking it. All right, so the answer I was going for is this is extreme overkill. Um, <laughs> and subsequent profiling actually shows it. So in a simulator, you can see how many cycles you're actually contending for the lock. And so you're spending 46.32, to be exact, on average, cycles waiting for this mutex. That's just up here. I didn't count into this figure the amount of time it's actually taking to move that cache line between the 16 cores that are operating this particular mutex or operating on this particular mutex. And then once I actually have it locked, I'm now only doing 14 cycles roughly of computation. And so 75% of my time spinning waiting for the lock, a lot of extra time that's unaccounted for moving that lock around. And then I've got to move the lock back again because, you know what, I mean, this is a contended lock. The other core is going to grab that line, change the, uh, change the coherent state, move that line over to its own core, and now you got to pull it all the way back to unlock it, because that's a modify operation right there. When I unlock it, I'm actually modifying the data that's in that line. So I have to go get modify permissions over that line again. Um, this all takes time. This is extremely wasteful. And so try not to do that. And that's all I mean by stay away from mutexes and be careful. This would be much better with compare and swap, this would be even better with a lot of the atomic uh, primitives that various manufacturers are offering. So you could actually do this, say, in your load queue or your L1 cache, L2s are the typical um, places that you do these. And now you don't have to have a lock at all. It's just an atomic that's done you know, transparently for you. Just offload it and go. And so no locking at all. Cuts down the data movement. And it's wonderful. Um, so yeah. Avoid this at all costs. And you'll see this in a lot of the uh, GitHub FIFOs as well. All right, any questions there? No, nope. all right. All right, so data alignment. So how big is a cache line typically? Sean? 64 bytes, exactly. All right, so if I have data that is used by two different cores on the same cache line, what's going to happen to that line if I try to access it? Okay, you're making hand motions over there. So, in words? Yeah. 
Exactly, you're going to induce false shearing and ping-ponging between those two cores. Um, so one thing that you can do is if that data is not necessarily in use by both of those uh, threads at the same exact time, you can basically pad that data structure to have you know, a size of 64 bytes, which is exactly what we saw in the mutex just before. Um, mutex is optimized to prevent false sharing, but we can do the same exact thing with our data structures. All you have to do is, well, one, technique, you can align stuff now in C++11. Two, old school, you can take a uh, buffer and pad out your data structure. Both of them essentially are gonna do roughly the same thing in memory. Um, your data layout is gonna be you know, 64 bytes in size, and you're only gonna use you know, however much of the data structure you actually intended on using. Um, space inefficient, yes. Sure, you're moving more data from memory, but here's the deal. You're moving data from one cache line to the other cache lines far fewer times. I mean, you're, you're, most people don't take that into account when they're actually building these structures. How many times I'm moving from say core zero to core one to core five? And what I found by looking at you know, lots of implementations and lots of uh, asynchronous software is that most of the programmers just don't take that into account. They move you know, cache lines inadvertently and cause all kinds of extra traffic. And that takes lots of extra energy and extra time. And so we can avoid that by doing things like padding and aligning. Um, okay, so alignment by page. We kind of covered that with prefetch prefetching just a little bit. Um, is there a question? No, okay, sorry. So alignment by page, we, we kind of covered that a bit, but that's one of the other things we can do. So to maximize the usage of our uh, translation look aside buffer, which is our translation cache on the fast path, we can you know, take that page that we're allocating stuff, make the maximal use of it for that particular core, and then kind of partition the rest of the data to the other pages. And so that makes sense because on that, you know, say core zero, I want to keep all the data in my translation cache that that core is going to need. And the other cores I don't care about. I don't, you know, I want to maximize my space or my translation space for each one of those uh, caches. All right, so. I think I'm uh, running down my last slide and I've got a few minutes left, so perfect. All right, so now, a little few more numbers. And this one's on locality. So I had a conversation, was it before lunch, um, with a gentleman and I was running this scenario by them. And he said, hey, I wouldn't have ever thought about that. And so I was like, yeah, this is perfect, I'll throw it in too. So locality. So where your threads actually run really matters. And it's for all the reasons we just talked about. So you have cache data, you have your translation data, all of it's local to that core and that thread that's running on the core. And it also matters for the consumer side where that data is, how local it is. And it's because of the coherent bus, it's because of my memory network, it takes time to get the data. And that's the critical thing. If you think about it, if I'm going from here to say the reception desk, it takes less time than if I'm a walk from here to say the airport. It's gonna take more time, it's fairly intuitive. Same thing in hardware. If you're moving one thread from a core to another core, the distance changes, literally. All right, so to make sense of these numbers, I gotta give you a little bit of background. So this is done using boosts, lock-free FIFO. Um, we're pinning the threads to the cores, which means that we are taking those threads and mapping them to specific cores in the system. They can't move anywhere else. Um, for this one, to minimize variation, because that's kind of the enemy of performance metrics, you wanna get as little variation in your numbers as possible. To minimize that, we took the whole binary space, all the memory that I was ever gonna allocate, and page locked it to DRAM, so that way if the pages are already touched, everything's mapped in, it's all hot and ready to go. Um, set the scheduler to real-time round robin, so nothing else can deschedule it except the thread itself, which is, again, exactly what I want. I want nothing to influence these results other than my FIFO and where the threads are actually placed. All right, so, yeah, and we did this multiple different methods, and this was done on a Haswell architecture, which happens to be my workstation, so, yeah. Okay, so, so everyone knows what, or everyone know what SMT is? Simultaneous multi-threading, yeah. Well, there's a lot, not a lot of nods in the crowd. Okay, so simultaneous multi-threading, basically I can run two threads, same core, basically you duplicate some structures, not others, but it gives the appearance of double number of cores. Um, that's a very simplistic explanation. Um, but in a nutshell, it means I use the same exact caches um, for both of those cores because, well, it is in fact the same exact core that they're running on. It just looks like to the operating system that's two. So, in this case, just for fun, as the base case, 
we map the producer to core one and the consumer to core 25. Can anybody tell me why we didn't use core zero on Linux? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so usually you mask things like interrupts and things or interrupt handlers to that core. So you don't want to do any performance measurements on that one. Um, but okay, so between core one and core 25, producer to consumer, this is what we get in cycles. And I guess I should have also mentioned we turned off the frequency scaling, so that's constant as well. So in this case, between two cores, which are sharing the same exact L1 data cache, we end up with just a little bit over 150 cycles, and that's roughly like 60 nanoseconds on this machine. And as expected, we end up with uh, zero um, cache misses in both accounts. Instructions, relatively constant. And these are averaged over a few million executions, just so we have a nice constant baseline. And yeah, so that's pretty much exactly what we'd expect. 60 nanoseconds is you know, really good between producer and consumer. Um, yeah, it gets worse from there. So common scenario, same socket. Now we want to communicate between two different cores that are located ostensibly on the same coherent uh, network. And so these are not shared L1, L2 caches because those are all private, typically in modern architectures. Um, maybe you have a shared L3, but that's about it. And so you're going to be communicating from producer to consumer down here. And wow, that jumps up. And so now <laughs> we can you know, just assume that this is you know, 460 instructions extra because the only thing that's really changing here is the placement and the non-sharing of the L1, the L2, and having to actually go across that coherent network then back through the cache uh, hierarchy. And so we have lots of extra time waiting for data. And now we see on the producer and the consumer side the exact same number of cache misses because we instrumented both of these separately with uh, performance counters. And then, again, this is exactly what I would expect. We have roughly the same number of actual instructions executed, which means this difference here is actually you know, the memory movement itself. So does that make sense? No questions? Okay. So what you see here is by moving from one core, which was this one, to this one, I've just now, you know, what is that, added 460 cycles onto my communications path? Yes? So, so, so the 600 cycles, that's for what, for pushing one item? That's just pushing one item. That is the latency between pushes. And the way we did this, um, it's really difficult between two different cores to actually get good measurements. And so to do this, basically we set a FIFO op that is size one, and then we measured the inter-push time. And so the number of cycles using Intel cycle counter, in this case, RDTSCP, um, between one push and exactly the next push. And so as soon as you have that act back that the consumer has actually pulled that item off a queue, um, you can now push another item. And so we did this two different ways. We also did a ping pong uh, round trip approach and divide by two, um, and that had the exact same results. And so this method was simpler, so we used it. Any other questions? No, we got one, yes. Setting up the experiment is pretty tricky. You gotta get it all right. Um, God, yes. <laughs> and, and you have very little visibility into, unless you control everything, and then you basically figure out in your head what the bottleneck well, was. Well, yeah, the nice thing on our architectures is we have simulators, and I can say on this particular, well, yeah, on this particular ARM architecture. A simulator where you can see yeah. measurements inside what you normally couldn't get at. Well, the thing is, so, okay, um, let's take a step back in simulators. How much time do I have before I go off on a tangent? I've got exactly 30 minutes. So the question was, what kind of visibility we had inside the simulator or inside the architecture to actually find where the bottlenecks are in this data movement? So how do we get from the roughly 150 cycles to this ginormous 600 cycles? Um, so inside a simulator, one, simulation is difficult. It's not easy. It's slow. Um, two, simulating multiple cores, multiple threads is even more difficult. And simulating a coherent network with multiple cores, multiple threads is, for a small section of code, is a week long process um, to actually do accurately. And it's also fraught with difficulties, especially when simulating architectures that I myself did not design. And so this is an Intel architecture. And now, is anybody from Intel here by chance might be able to know? Yes. Okay, so do you want to speak to bottlenecks? <laughs> uh, in terms of what? In terms of why we jumped from six or jumped from 150 to 600. I hate to put you on the spot. It might be kind of fun though. <laughs> okay, so I got gotcha. you. So through performance counters though, the best we can infer is that 
it is past the instruction, so it's not in the core itself. And we can take a look at the instruction count. We're not issuing any more instructions. We're actually stalled on loads and stores. And we've doubled, well, we've gone 7x on our misses. So we're missing on every cache all the way through for everything, for our push and for our pop. And yeah, I mean, that's pretty much all you can say is that between the caches and the coherent network, and that, I mean, honestly, is perfectly reasonable for that 450 cycles. So I mean, if you talk, so L2 between what, 10 and 20 cycles, you're talking L3, like 35, 40 cycles, um, then the coherent network probably going from one side to the other, eh, at swag, say 70 cycles, depending on the configuration. Um, yeah, I mean, that's just a rough guess, depending on the type of configuration of the network, et cetera. So, yeah, all this is from communication. What did you use for um, your uh, performance counter? So these are all, so the cache stats are all um, PAPI um, statistics. And so instrumenting, are you familiar with the uh, PAPI yeah. toolkit? Yeah, yeah. so um, that's pretty much the easiest way to do it. I mean, you can use the raw um, CPU or CPU uh, counters yourself, but this takes more time to set up. Um, then for the cycles, um, that's a simpler. Um, and then for everything else, again, that's all the uh, operating system, the schedulers, the memory locking, et cetera. All right. Okie dokie. So now we're going to get even worse because I still have one other core over here that I have to talk to. All right. So now, since this is a dual socket system and I want to go from core one as my producer all the way to core 47. Um, using the example of going to the reception center versus the airport, this is a lot longer distance, even wire length from one side to the next. So there's a lot more buses, a lot more networks, a lot more queues, a lot more things I have to go through. And yeah, and so we see the expected increase in communications delay. And given that I see seven cache misses here and five here, and this is across averaged over, you know, I think we used uh, one million for this uh, set of experiments. The only thing that tells me is that potentially there's something called a snoop filter or something else that's blocking uh, the traffic going across. And so false sharing that's from here that would have otherwise occur on the same socket going to dual socket isn't actually happening. And so I'm missing here, but I'm actually not snooping that particular cache, which is kind of cool to see that the hardware stuff that we've come up with and put together to prevent this sort of thing actually works. Um, okay, so the bottom line is locality matters. So if I'm looking at building a runtime or manually placing threads, or if I'm doing, I don't know, latency sensitive stuff like, I don't know, high frequency trading, for instance, I might want to have all my threads exactly where the data matters and the less latency, you know, sensitive stuff push off to another core and then start it again. And so in general, a rule of thumb I like to use is enter socket, you can do lots of smaller stuff. Between sockets, bulk up your communications. And so if you're gonna do, you know, say core one to core 47, make the most of it. Go ahead and shoot as much across that, uh, you know, socket link as you can. And different interconnects behave differently, but you know, you can find out the best optimal bulk granularity for your interconnect going from one to the next. So, yeah. I mean, you're always gonna incur this latency, but what's gonna change is the amount of data you can actually move per that latency. And that's the granularity is gonna change what I was trying to say. So any questions on that? No, okay. I think we are, yeah, perfect. So conclusions. All right, so moving data from one core to the next is complicated. That was pretty much a take home on this one. Data movement matters, it takes time. And there's a lot of stuff that you can play with, optimize, even from a software perspective. There's systems interfaces, there's data structures you can optimize, um, and there's instructions you can insert to make things just a little bit better. So remember cache line alignment, um, page alignment, uh, translation, always minimize that one because that one's huge in a lot of cases. And this is in general, I mean, it's not just FIFOs, this goes for many other applications as well. Translation will kill you in a lot of them. Um, data placement, remember your NUMA nodes where you're actually putting the memory. It matters, and especially once we start getting non-volatiles in systems. And then when possible, localize your transfers. And so in things like where I showed the Haswell example, we're doing the boost FIFO, placing the data, or placing the producer and consumer as close together as possible, using as much shared state as possible matters.
it matters, you know, you're talking the difference of 1400 cycles versus 200. That's a huge difference. And for a latency uh, sensitive application, that's, you know, giant amount of time. So, all right. And then lastly, shameless pitch for my uh, presentation tomorrow, I'll be doing the uh, Raflib runtime, I think in uh, beta at what, 11 o'clock. So join me there and that'd be cool. So with that, take any more questions from the audience and yeah, that's all I got. If anybody's not totally asleep. Yes. So you tested the, the boost not free. Did you try other not free queues? Like so, favorite to throw out here? So the question was, um, did we try other um, lock free queues or ring buffers or any other queue implementations? Um, yes, we tried quite a few. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't have a list of favorites. Um, Interestingly enough, once you start getting into the optimized ones, um, programmers really start you know, paying attention to their uh, you know, behaviors. Some of the things like the systems programming they don't do because not all of them are portable. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I like the Boost um, FIFO. I also like my own. Um, <laughs> I also like uh, some of the ring buffer implementations. I try to stay away from the uh, virtual memory remapped um, so-called FIFOs for various reasons, um, namely because it really messes up the uh, translation infrastructure inside your cores. Um, and we can talk about that offline or after the uh, presentation if you want. It's kind of actually interesting the way it behaves between the L2 and L1. Um, okay, so any other questions? Yes? Uh, do you have time on how long it takes to push multiple items? Or do you have time and space in between the queue and I push like four items at a time? Yeah, so the question was do we have uh, timings on pushing multiple items into the queue? Um, so interestingly enough, um, it depends on the granularity of the size you're actually pushing. And so for instance, if I have, say, a cache line size item. The latency is actually going to look like a uh, cache line size you know, wave of latencies. And so it's really per cache line, it's not per um, data granularity. So if you break it out into 64 byte chunks, those latencies still hold. Um, if I'm pushing multiple cache lines, it's going to be that latency times that number of cache lines. Sometimes architectures will bulk up the number of cache lines once you start going across sockets. Um, but that's a whole other matter. And so Yes, I have numbers, but it's complicated. But in general, 64 bytes is a good estimate for those numbers. So, any other questions? Well, it's unfortunate, I was hoping for a few more. Okay, well, if that's it, then that's all I've got. So, thanks guys.